Self-awareness means to know what is my passion, what is my purpose. How many people in this world have a North Star? Something that they know they're aiming for in this life. A reference point which then helps them to know in every situation what direction they should take. They say the best alarm clock in the world is purpose. But most people in this world haven't really found a purpose or a passion. There may be things that they feel inspired about for some time and then they kind of go on to something else or a goal that they set and then once they meet that goal they're looking for something else. But how many people have a passion and a purpose that's unchanging, that really brings out the best in them and inspires them with a hunger and enthusiasm for life. Thank you so much everyone for coming. I really appreciate you taking the time and uh, yeah, it's kind of the middle of the day, but all of you took the time to come here. I really appreciate that. Uh, my name is Keshava Swami. I, I grew up in London. Don't worry, I'm not going to give you my whole life story. Um, but I grew up in London and uh, yeah, I guess when I was about 15, I began searching, looking into different uh, spiritual wisdom traditions, literatures. I guess I had a lot of questions of life, meaning, purpose. And then when I was 18, I went to university, um, not as good as Berkeley. I studied at UCL London, uh, University College London, and I studied computer science and management. And uh, university was a really transformational time for me. That's why it's always nice to come into the universities, um, because it was a time when I was really exploring myself and, yeah, I guess journeying into the unknown and looking into different ways to approach life. And uh, after I graduated from university when I was 21, I decided to uh, disconnect from the world a little bit. And I journeyed to India and I went on a six month journey to India and uh, yeah, lived in ashrams, went to holy places and did a lot of reading and hearing. And uh, I guess in those six months, I began to also hear a bit more of my heart and what my purpose um, in life could and maybe should be. And so when I came back in 2002 to London, I decided to uh, um, be a monk for one year. Um, we had a monastery, we have a monastery on the outskirts of London. And so I joined there and uh, I guess after one year, I just found it to be my natural calling, my, uh, yeah, my purpose. And, and so one year became two, which became five, which became ten. And yeah, over 20 years later, I still live as a monk um, and still learning. And so today I come in front of you, not as someone who knows it all, but as someone who I hope will be able to offer you some wisdom, which may get you thinking. Uh, this session is very, very informal, so at any time if you feel like you want to ask a question or just put your hand right up and I really do encourage you also to, to, to ask questions and uh, you're also welcome to challenge me as well in a, in, in a friendly way, of course, um, so that we can get more out of this conversation. Does that sound good? Is everyone good? Comfortable? All right, so let's let's kind of go on this journey a bit. So today we're talking about something which I think is a really important topic and I think you will also find it to be an important topic, finding your authentic self. Put your hands up if sometimes you feel like you're not your authentic self. You're drawn into inauthenticity. Yeah, I think we all have that experience. Today we're going to explore why does that happen? Why do we uh, sometimes get drawn into inauthenticity? How do we find ourselves? How do we understand our calling? And what can the ancient literatures from the East help us to understand about who we really are? Because perhaps if we don't know identity, then everything else in life is a bit of a mystery. 
But when we begin with understanding, having a deep self-awareness, everything else becomes clear. I'm going to ask you guys to do an experiment before I begin. Um, and if you have a phone, uh, you could, now is the time to hold your phone and uh, maybe open up a notepad. I'm just going to ask you four questions and I just want you guys to write down the answer on your phone, if that's okay. Um, uh, it will be good, yeah. It will just be four simple questions. And I don't want you, when I ask you these questions, don't like overthink it too much because you might try to start second guessing the speaker. <laughs> just, uh, just write down whatever comes to your mind straight away, yeah? Is that good? Everyone got a, got a phone open? Yeah? All right, great. So the first question I want to ask all of you is, can you write down your favorite animal? And just in one word, describe that animal or why it's your favorite animal. Is that okay? Simple enough? All right. I'm going to go quick because I don't want you to overthink it. Question number two. I want you to write down your second favorite animal. <laughs> and the one word you'd use to describe why you find that animal to be your second favorite. What is it about that animal? If someone asks you to describe that animal in one word, what word would you use? All right, good. All right, question number three. I want you to write down your favorite color and in one word, how that color makes you feel. Is that okay? Okay, and the fourth and final question, for this one you have to close your eyes. Um, I want you for one minute or less than a minute to just imagine you're entering a, a room which is completely white. You enter a room which is completely white. The floors are white, the walls are white, the ceiling's white, uh, and it's completely empty. It's just a white room. Just be in that room, just kind of feel its presence. And then I want you to just write down, when you feel comfortable, one emotion you feel in that white room. Yeah? Everyone good? All right, thank you so much for being open-minded to this uh, uh, psychological experiment. <laughs> so believe it or not, I'm not sure why this keeps going on and off. I'm not sure, uh, okay, I'm not sure. Have you ever done this experiment before, anyone? Okay, so this is actually a psychological experiment which is meant to reveal certain things to about us that we may not even be aware of. You can tell me like how you'd score it. So the first question I asked you was, what's your favorite animal? Uh, should I tell you what it signifies or do you want to give me your answers first? I should tell you first, right? Otherwise it could be dangerous. <laughs> Or you're gonna, okay, give us your answers first, just to make it interesting. Anyone want to tell us your favorite animal? And well, yep. Uh, dog for loyalty. Dog for loyalty. Cow for motherly, affectionate. Cow for motherly, affectionate. Uh, monkey, because it's playful. Monkey, because it's playful. Okay. Anyone else? Yeah. Yeah. Dog for soulful. Okay, so psychologically, what this question is meant to depict is how you see yourself. 
Put your hand up if you think it's accurate. Okay. Oh, 60-70%. Okay. The second question I asked you was your second favorite animal. Anyone want to just tell us the quality? Just get one or two. Second favorite animal, anyone? Yeah? Monkey for its energy. Monkey for its energy. Yep, back there. Tiger for its fierceness. Okay. So, psychologically, this question is said to reveal what you look for in your ideal partner. Yeah. <laughs> I can see some shocked faces there. Uh, yes, that is, uh, that is apparently what it means. Okay, the third question I asked you was your favorite color and how that makes you feel. Anyone want to give us some answers for that? Now you're super scared. <laughs> no, everyone's like, no, 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 tell me what it is. Anyone want to tell us uh, your favorite color? Yeah, there at the back. Blue. Green. Blue. And? Green. Free. Green. Free. Yeah. Blue and it free. <coughs> Freedom. Nice. Anyone else? Yeah. Yellow for peace. Yellow for peace. Yeah. Uh, green for grounded. Green for grounded. Okay. This question is meant to depict how you think other people see you. So this is how you believe other is, is one thing what you think about yourself, but it's another thing what you think people perceive about you. So that's interesting. And the final one about the white room. Can someone just say some of their emotions that they felt in the white room? Any emotions that came out? Yeah? Peace. Peace. Stress. Stressed. Okay. Interesting. Oh. Or wonder. Anyone else? One more? Yeah. Clean. Clean and? Clear. Clean. Okay, similar. So this uh, question is psychologically meant to reveal uh, your thoughts and your feelings about death. Yeah. Everyone has a uh, different vision, a different perception of death. Why am I doing this with you? Uh, of course, it's just an icebreaker. But, uh, but it is also instructive. Because oftentimes there is a sense of identity, either a conception that we have of ourselves or a conception that others have of us, which we're not even aware of. In the world today, there's uh, such a such a problem in the world of people becoming disconnected and not knowing themselves, lacking kind of self-awareness. Um, one, uh, one person, he says, I'm not who I think I am. I'm not even who you think I am. I'm who I think you think I am. In other words, in this world, it's so easy to become so disconnected from who we actually are. They actually say that there's only two times in your life when you're really who you are for most people. You know when those two times are? When you're a kid and when you're really old. Because when you're a kid, you don't really care what anyone thinks about you. And when you're old, you don't have any energy anymore to like try and act out someone else's life. Oh, it's gone. I'm not sure why this happens. It keeps coming in and out. Is it is it loose connection or Yeah, so there's such a such a risk in today's world that people are not self-aware. Can I ask you a question? What do you think it is in the world today that causes us to 
live a life of inauthenticity in which we're not really being able to find who we are or express who we are to the world? What do you think it is in life that draws us into inauthenticity? Any ideas from your own experiences? Yeah. Yeah, we're surrounded by so many opinions, expectations, we're surrounded by so much noise that sometimes that becomes so loud that we don't live the life that's authentic to us. Yeah? There, for example, there may be people in your life that you want to please. So sometimes pleasing those people may sometimes take precedence over finding uh, or doing or expressing who you really are. Good point. Anything else? What else do you think draws us into living an inauthentic life or presenting ourselves to the world in a way which is not actually who we are? Yeah. Yeah, a a amazing, yeah, we want to be accepted, we want to be appreciated, we want to be acknowledged and we want to fit in with the world and therefore sometimes fitting in and not standing out, sometimes being accepted according to the traditions and the trends of the world we're living in takes precedence over um, living our true life or expressing ourselves truly, great point. Anything else? Yeah. Uh, not knowing who you are. Not knowing who you are. Uh, just a, a sense of not, and why don't we know who we are? Trying to fit other people's roles versus trying to get a better understanding of what one wants out of life, what, what one's own goals are, as opposed to the mold that we discuss that maybe other people put on us or meeting other people's expectations. Okay, so that's another one. Sometimes we just don't have the space in our life to deeply think about these things. Sometimes you think, why would I have to think about who I am? I mean, I've lived with myself my whole life. But the idea is that if you don't have time to actually deeply think about these things, then you may not actually be thinking for yourself. You may actually be just responding to things around you and then accepting that that's who I am. So sometimes we, we just don't make the time to think about who I am. Excellent point. Yeah. Going back to the first, uh, the question, the second question. You said that that's supposed to reveal what you're seeking as part of that. Why is it not something that you also seek within yourself? Yeah. Well, uh, it's actually explained that oftentimes what we seek in other people is what we feel we lack within ourselves. And therefore, sometimes it's very revealing what we look for in other people because it shows what vacuum there may be within us. And therefore, uh, oftentimes um, we're drawn into inauthenticity because we try to cover up a lacking within us out of esteem or out of a sense of insecurity. So sometimes this is, you kind of raise another point which draws us into inauthenticity is because we know there's a lacking within me here and to specifically cover that up to the world we act in an inauthentic way because we don't want an exposure of what we perceive to be a weakness within ourself. So, um, so yeah, and we can go further with this. Uh, I don't know why this is like somehow cutting out. Anyone else? Last points on why you think uh, we sometimes are drawn into an inauthentic life or presenting ourselves as something we're not? Yeah. Maybe because that's easy. It's that's easy. Why is it easier to be inauthentic? You would, you would, intuitively you would think it's more easy to be your authentic self. It's less work. So why is it easier to be inauthentic? Because then we don't have to think about what is right or wrong. We just do what is right according to society. And that's easy because you don't have to stand out. And okay, so it's the more comfortable thing to do. It's the, more, it's the kind of lazy thing to do where you don't have to go against the grain. You don't have to challenge. 
you don't have you take the path of least resistance and just kind of go along with things excellent I'm sharing all these points with you I think they'll be valuable for you because sometimes you can take these points away and ask yourself am I being drawn into an inauthentic life when I'm functioning in my social circles when I'm functioning in the world out there am I really presenting who I am or am I susceptible to these external things which are causing me to be uh, someone I'm actually not one English writer he says to be yourself in a world which is pushing you to be something else is the greatest achievement. To actually be your real self in a world which is pushing you to be something else is actually the greatest achievement. What we share with people is that self-awareness means the ability to ask the answer these questions. What are my values? What are the values which guide my decisions, my directions, my relationships, my interactions with this world? What are those cardinal values which I hold in the highest regard? If we don't know that, we're disconnected from actually understanding ourselves. If someone asked you what are your strengths and what are your weaknesses, would we be able to accurately decipher what unique abilities and potentialities I have in my character and where sometimes I'm susceptible to falling short and being uh, in some way uh, exposed in my weakness? Many people don't even know their strengths and weaknesses. And therefore what happens is they make decisions in life not knowing that they're not utilizing their strengths and at the same time making decisions and directions in which they're not aware of their weaknesses drawing them into a territory which then causes them problems in their life ask yourself do i really know my strengths and weaknesses this is a huge one in the world today self-awareness means to know what is my passion what is my purpose how many people in this world have a North Star? Something that they know they're aiming for in this life. A reference point which then helps them to know in every situation what direction they should take. They say the best alarm clock in the world is purpose. But most people in this world haven't really found a purpose or a passion. There may be things that they feel inspired about for some time and then they kind of go on to something else or a goal that they set and then once they meet that goal they're looking for something else. But how many people have a passion and a purpose that's unchanging that really brings out the best in them and inspires them with a hunger and enthusiasm for life? If we don't have that, we're not fully self-aware. This is also really important. Self-awareness means to know what is my natural habitat. Each of us are different, so each of us strive in different uh, habitats, in different environments. And oftentimes, because we don't know what is our natural habitat, we expose ourselves to environments and situations which actually disempower us. Have you tried swimming in a river uh, against the current? Very difficult. But it's amazing, isn't it? When you go on the airport and they have those long corridors and then you go on the, you know, that, I don't know what they call it, like an escalator or whatever. It's amazing, isn't it? You're just walking. It's just like effort. You just like, you see, it feels like you're not even walking, just like you're flying. Because uh, when you embrace the right habitat that means uh, the right diet you watch the right things you expose yourself to the right types of people you uh, hear the right types of noises and narratives and opinions around you um, you embrace the right type of lifestyle if you understand 
what is the habitat in which I will strive? In life, you can do amazing things. But what we're doing is we're completely disempowering ourselves often because we just place ourselves in unnatural situations. And this is also a huge part of self-awareness. What are my behaviors and what are my emotions? Have you ever watched a video of yourself? Anyone? <laughs> sometimes we do a lot of public speaking. And so like now and again, sometimes you can be somewhere and then you hear yourself speaking. You think like, who is that guy, you know? <laughs> It's amazing sometimes to just observe yourself. Imagine for one day if someone actually videoed you for your whole life in that day and you watched yourself. You'd get so much insight into your behaviors, your patterns of functioning, your emotional state, how you react to different things. But most of us don't have this kind of self-awareness. But when you know the psyche, the behaviors, the emotional responses that are generated by certain types of triggers, then you become so self-aware that you know moving forward how you can uh, uh, act in and, and place yourself in the right way. When we don't know the answers to these questions, then we're living an inauthentic life. And shall I tell you the other thing? Even when we know the answers to these questions, but we don't live in line with those answers, then we're often living an inauthentic life. And therefore, before we go out there and change the world, before we go out there and try to uh, create a revolution, or it actually begins here. Gandhi, he said, be the change you want to see in the world. Unless we're situated in a deep sense of self-awareness, we'll never really be able to do what we're meant to do um, in this life. And so this is how I'm kind of beginning my discussion today, just by raising some of these points with you um, about why we're drawn into inauthenticity, and how inauthenticity looks uh, if we don't have that self-awareness. Um, let me just pause there for a second and see whether any of you may have any questions or comments or anything you'd like to kind of, it doesn't even have to be a question, you may just want to add something in just to get a little bit of feedback from you. Is there anyone who'd like to ask or any questions? Or Yes. Selfish or self-centered during this process because I've had times hearing when like you focus too much on yourself you're called selfish um, I want to make sure that we find the right balance between uh, finding ourselves <coughs> and being self-aware and then helping the world but also not becoming too selfish and too egocentric amazing it's a great question Nowadays, I'm, I'm kind of traveling across the world, so I'm kind of moving every three, four days, I'm on a plane somewhere. So, you know, like when they at the start of the flight, they do the whole like um, safety thing. Like I basically memorize the whole thing now. Like I could be like a steward, you know, no problem. <laughs> but, you know, one of the first things they say is they say, in the event of an emergency, the gas mask will fl fall down. And before you put it on anyone else, what should you do? Put it on yourself. Because if you don't know, if you're not healthy, if, you're not, um, if you don't have that kind of stability, that strength yourself, you're not going to be useful to anyone. It's amazing, they did a study of the most compassionate people in the world. And they tried to understand what made them so compassionate. And shall I tell you something revealing? You know the one quality which was common in all compassionate people is that they all created boundaries in their life. And it's so counterintuitive. Because you think like, no, compassion means like you're giving. But the idea is that by drawing boundaries, <clears throat> by investing in themselves, then what happens is that they come out into the world and become empowered to give the best of themselves. The best thing you can offer the world is yourself. 
You can't take the world to a higher place than what you've reached internally yourself. And, then, and therefore, when the spiritualists engage in self-awareness, self-care, uh, self-nourishment, it, is, uh, it never becomes selfish because they know that I'm doing this work for the purpose of then coming out to give myself in a bigger, a better, and a more impactful and powerful way. So, um, it's basically, we see it as an investment and we don't see it as an end in itself. To be self-aware is not the end. To be self-aware is uh, a goal so that we can then go on into the world and make a contribution to people's lives and a contribution to making uh, the world a better place. According to the ancient teachers of the East, the goal of life is service, service to the world. Rabindranath Tagore, he, he has a nice quote. He said, I went to sleep and dreamt that life was joy. I woke up and realized life was service. But then I started serving and realized service was joy. In other words, uh, when we serve the world, when we make a contribution to other people's lives, that's really the goal. But being self-aware, being self, uh, having self-love, uh, being uh, self-nourished uh, is the foundation of that. You can't give what you don't have. And so the spiritualist always keeps that in mind as the North Star, that the goal of life is service and to make a contribution. Is that okay? Yeah, thank you. Yes, at the back. Where do we find all of these answers to the five questions? <laughs> yeah, that's the $64 million question. Yeah, how do we find the answers to these questions? Okay, can you hold that thought? I'm going to, because that will kind of be the next part of the presentation. So I'll come back to that. Yeah, yeah. Can we change who we are authentically? Okay. That's also the next part of the presentation. So you guys, yeah, you guys are one step ahead, you know. So I'll come to that. I'll come back to that. And if I haven't answered it at the end, then ask me. Yeah. Just any last questions on this part of the presentation? Um, okay. So I think we're ready to go ahead because you're already thinking about those things. Okay. So now let me kind of uh, transport you back uh, 5,000 years to someone who was basically lacking in self-awareness. Sometimes in our life we have a sense of an identity crisis. <coughs> Recently it was, uh, it was my birthday and someone came and he said, oh, it's your birthday. He said, how old are you? I said, uh, I'm 42. He said, you're in the zone. I said, what do you mean? He goes, 42, that means midlife crisis. <laughs> because that's the age that people usually have a midlife crisis an existential confusion who am I, why am I existing what's the, what's the purpose of it so this existential confusion this sense of identity crisis is something which happened uh, 5,000 years ago here I'm kind of showing you a scene of a battlefield and this is an ancient scene uh, which depicts an ancient conversation uh, which took place in uh, the East, in a Sanskrit language. This is a conversation between someone called Krishna and Arjuna. I'm sure many of you are familiar. And uh, the conversation takes place on a battlefield. Arjuna is basically a warrior, and he's about to embark on a kind of fratricidal uh, battle. And just as the battle is about to commence, his charioteer, Krishna, who's kind of uh, navigating him through the battlefield. Just as the war is about to start, Arjuna says to Krishna, can you take me to the middle of the battlefield so I can kind of think about everything that's going on here? This battlefield is not just a literal place. It is a literal place that you can actually go to even today. But this battlefield represents the battlefield of life. So in some sense, it's metaphorical that we're all living on a battlefield. And Arjuna, what he does in the middle of all of that chaos, as the battle is about to begin, he takes the time out to say, like, one second, 
I've really got to think about who I am, what I'm doing, and whether I should be fighting in this war. And so what Krishna does is he takes Arjun's chariot to the middle of the battlefield. Herein lies the first lesson of the Bhagavad Gita. That it doesn't matter how busy life is, it doesn't matter how many demands and responsibilities are on our, that are on our head, it doesn't matter how many things are going on around us, spending time to actually understand who we are and giving that quality time is absolutely indispensable. Some things are so important in life that it's not about having time. It's about making time. Like imagine you went onto a motorway and after half an hour you kind of ran out of petrol and then you said to the driver like, we, like we're, what's happening? He goes, we're out of petrol. You say like, but didn't you go to the petrol station before we... He said, well, we didn't have time. No, that would be completely ludicrous. Because if you're going to go up the motorway, it's not a question of having time to put petrol in the car. It's so essential that you've got to make time. And so the first lesson we learn from Arjun is that most people in life just forget this point. Because the busyness of life just carries them away so much that they forget to do the most important thing, which is to ask the question, Who am I? Who am I really? So Arjun, he begins asking these questions. It's like, imagine you went on a train and you know, you are sitting opposite from someone and you know, just to be nice as you do on a train, you kind of said to the person like, oh, nice to meet you. Like, where did you just come from? And the person says, I don't know. You think like, okay, that's like a little strange. Like. And then you look at the person and say like, okay, like, but, but where are you going? And the person's like, I don't know. And then you're like, okay, like, I'm about to call the police here. And then you say like, but what are you doing on this train? And the person's like, I don't know. Like, you'd think they're ready for like some psychological help. But maybe many people are like that. Because how many of us have taken the time to deeply ask ourselves, where did I come from? How did I land here in this world? Where am I going after this chapter ends? And is there a deeper purpose to life? Why am I here? Why does this world exist? Why do I exist in my struggle of my human condition here? Now you may say those are complex questions, you can't answer them. You know, they're, they're, you know it's not as simple as the questions the guy asked on the train. But my point to you, or to anyone raising that doubt would be, but how many people have even tried? How many people have even made a serious study into deeply trying to understand what is their identity? It almost seems as though we take that point for granted without actually deeply considering uh, that point. And remember, if you don't know who you are, how will you ever be happy? It's like imagine you go into a phone shop and you say to the shopkeeper, I need a battery for my phone. What's the first thing they're going to ask you? What phone do you have? And then if you kind of say to them, don't ask such deep existential questions, you know, just give me a battery. Like, I can give you a battery, but it may not work. Happiness begins with understanding identity and purpose. And so that's what Arjun does. He asks these questions to Krishna. And this is the conversation that ensues, the Bhagavad Gita. So it's, uh, it's a beautiful book. It's uh, 700 verses long and it's uh, in a dialogue format. So Arjun is raising his doubts, his questions. And Krishna really begins with identity. So just to the question down there, someone was asking about self-awareness and uh, how do we actually become self-aware. And so these are some of the initial ideas that we're getting if you want to understand yourself. The first thing is make time and become thoughtful. 
The second thing is refer to higher sources of knowledge which can maybe give you perspectives and insights that you may not be able to glean yourself. The third point in finding self-awareness could be to ask people around you. Sometimes they say it's difficult to see the picture when you're inside the frame and therefore conversing with others and, um, and trying to uncover more of your own personality, that can also help. So these are all the traits that we see of Arjun as he tries to come to a deeper level of identity. And as he asks these questions of identity, Krishna basically begins the whole discourse of the Bhagavad Gita by explaining what our identity is. And what Krishna says to Arjun is that there's three aspects to our identity. We have a physical machine, a body, uh, which we see in the mirror every day made of five elements, earth, water, fire, air and ether. But what Krishna says is that physical body, that's not who you are. That's just machinery. Even modern science says every seven years, every single cell in your body has changed. That means your body is con continuously regenerating. If we were to all pick out our baby pictures here, we probably couldn't even match them because uh, the body is continually changing. Yet so many people identify with the body. Um, so many people think they are this body. So Krishna says, you also have a second identity, which is a subtle body. You have a mind, an intelligence, a sense of ego. Um, but Krishna says, that's not who you are either. That's just apparatus that you're using. Like for example, here is a computer, right? So then there's a keyboard, which is like the hardware. And then there's also software. But beneath that software or behind that software and hardware, Krishna says, is the soul, which is who we are, a spark of consciousness, a metaphysical uh, particle, which is animating this body. This is incredibly profound. This is a game changer. Uh, because... Uh, most people are not aware of their deeper identity. They very much are boxed into a very external understanding of themselves. And so what we're presenting here, and I don't know if we'll have time to do it today, but this idea that we are beyond the body and the mind is not just a religious or a spiritual or a, or a claim of faith. But actually, when you look closely, there is so much empirical, scientific, logical, rational evidence to corroborate this idea that we are non-material, non-physical entities. Um, it's amazing. Even in our language, it's almost intuitively ingrained within us that we're beyond this body because we always say, my arm my head, my brain, we even say my mind. So who is that owner? Who is that possessor? Who is that um, person who is beyond all of these things? Um, even when someone dies, we say they've passed away. But who's passed away? The body is right there in front of you. Even if I ask you to point to yourself, it's very interesting that we intuitively kind of go towards the heart. And in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna explains that the soul is actually situated in the heart region, which is the center of all the energy in the body. So this is very, very powerful, very, very uh, paradigm shifting. We're a gross body, we have a subtle body, but we are ultimately the soul which is driving um, this body. So then the question was, can we change our identity? Can we change who we are? So the idea is that the soul is unchangeable. The soul is eternal. The soul is never born, never dies. 
And uh, in that sense, the soul is completely unchange unchangeable. In the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna explains what are the characteristics of the soul. And in essence, he says in three Sanskrit words, Sat, Chit, Ananda. Sat means it's eternal. Chit means it's sentient. And Ananda means it's full of bliss. And Krishna explains that the soul has its own personality. He says every soul is unique, every soul is amazing. But these are the universal qualities of every soul. It's interesting, when you read fairy tales, how does every fairy tale end? And they lived happily ever after. That is actually a deeply theological point. Because when the fairy tale says they live ever after, that's referring to the Sat, the eternality of the soul. When the fairy tale says they lived, that's referring to Chit, the sentience of the soul. And when the fairy tales said they were happy, that refers to Ananda, which is the bliss aspect of the soul. So <laughs> even, even the fairy tale uh, writers got it right when they said, we live happily ever after. But do we live happily ever after in this world? Do we? No, we don't. And that already is an indication that this world, this body, these coverings are artificial. C.S. Lewis, the Christian writer, he said something profound. If I find in myself a desire which no experience of this world can fulfill, then I must conclude I was made for another world. Very, very beautiful, he says. So when we look at the innate desires and characteristics of the soul, that is unchangeable. But what Krishna explains is that right now, we're possessing a subtle body, a mind and intelligence, and a physical body, and those things to some extent are always changing. We change in our personality, we change in our knowledge, we change in our desires of what we want to do in this life. And so in that sense, the aspect of our identity that's constantly changing is the material aspect of our identity, which is the external aspect. But the spiritual aspect of our identity, the essence of who we are, that is unchanging. And so in this way, um, Krishna begins to help Arjun understand his deeper identity and his uh, deeper purpose. I don't know why. <laughs> so yeah. So this is how the Bhagavad Gita begins. And what the Bhagavad Gita explains is that when we're rooted in this sense of identity, thank you, when we're rooted in this sense of identity, then it can draw, uh, drive our journey forward. Because we have these two sides to our identity, Krishna says that life has two sides of success. We want to have good relationships, we want to have good health, we want to raise a family, leave a legacy. Are these bad things? No, they're very good. But these things don't necessarily speak to our deeper aspirations, our deeper goals. Um, because most people don't know about the deeper aspect of their identity. And so what is revealed in the Bhagavad Gita is that most people only know the material side of their identity and therefore they only set material goals for themselves. Now the Bhagavad Gita is not saying those material goals are useless or unimportant. But what the Bhagavad Gita is saying is that if you simply pursue those aspects of success, even if you meet them, you may find that you're not completely satisfied at the end. And therefore Krishna helps to reveal to Arjuna that there's another side to your identity, there's another side to life, and there's another deeper journey that you can go on. So this word dharma is a very important word which arises in the Bhagavad Gita again and again. And essentially it means the essence of one's being. So Krishna says you have two types of dharma, a calling in this life and a calling in the ultimate journey of life. 
the Svadharma or the material calling is very much pertaining to our body and mind. But then we also have a spiritual calling, which is an inner calling, uh, which is universal. The left side or the right side deals with our immediate duties in this world and worldly expectations, whereas the spiritual side deals with ultimate aspirations and spiritual callings. So today's topic is authenticity amidst superficiality. In a world which is constantly boxing us into material approaches to life, it takes a very determined and brave and uh, adventurous soul to start challenging things. But it takes an even more bold person to then begin putting time and energy into actually trying to uncover the answers. And then it takes someone even more courageous, once they've found the answers, to actually live their authentic life. Because in doing that, often you have to go against the grain and you have to break out of the mold. And therefore, the quote that I started with uh, rings true even more once we've understood this, which is in a world that is pushing you to be something you're not, being yourself is the greatest achievement. And, and that's really what the whole spiritual endeavor is about, finding uh, not just outer success in this world, which is based on our abilities, our facilities and our temporary identities, but finding the inner success based on who we really are, the success of uncovering our spiritual character, consciousness, and ultimate connection. And so these are just some thoughts that I wanted to uh, share with you today. Um, we are at 10 past 12. Uh, I think we have five or 10 minutes, is it? To, yeah, if anyone has any. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you for uh, taking the time. And uh, appreciate it. So, uh, yes, we have time for questions, and yeah, be as open as you like, and I'll try my best to share some thoughts. Yes, thank you. Yes. Um, in the beginning, when you talked about self-awareness being, having an understanding of the five questions mm -hmm. that you um, addressed, I was, the one that involves self-purpose, I was initially thinking of more of the outer components of self-purpose. Like, towards the end, I started to reevaluate what that question meant. And I'm wondering whether it's, it means having a sense of your inner self-purpose on the spiritual level or outer. Oh, that's amazing. Such a great question. Yeah. Yeah, we have a purpose in this world and we have a purpose beyond this world. And the ideal life is when we're able to seamlessly integrate both. For example, each of us have certain abilities, uh, certain talents, certain strengths that we've been invested with divinely. So the first thing is to understand, as I said, what those strengths and abilities are. And then we have to understand that those strengths and abilities were given to us in order to serve the world now. So someone may do it as a lawyer, someone may do it as a musician, someone may do it as an artist. Um, but what they do is they take their passion, they take their expertise, and then they use it as a service. What we tell people is Dharma, the simple formula is Dharma equals your passion plus your expertise plus what you can use in service. When you find an activity, an occupation, an engagement in this world, that, is, that you're passionate about, that you're good at, and that you use to serve others, you're in your dharma. And then what happens, because you're using it in service for a spiritual purpose, then it also helps you in your ultimate purpose, which is the purpose of realizing who you are as a soul, realizing your connection with the divine, that service in the world 
becomes part of also your inner journey of discovering your spiritual connection with divinity. Does that make sense? Yeah, and in that sense, we have a Svadharma and a Sanatan Dharma, which means, uh, and they have to be integrated. And that's what Krishna says to Arjuna on the battlefield. He says, you're a warrior. And Arjuna's like, yeah, yeah, no, but I'm a soul. I'm supposed to be going to the spiritual world. I'm supposed to be connecting. And Krishna says, yes. And your immediate duty here on the battlefield is the means by which you're going to achieve that spiritual connection. And they're not divorced. This is one of the problems in life that we tend to compartmentalize our life. And we're like, yeah, from Monday to Saturday, I do my job and I work in the world and I just get money. And then uh, on a Sunday, that's the time I spend for my spiritual uh, upliftment. But actually, when you're living a dynamic spiritual life, you find a job which is contributing to your spiritual upliftment and which is directly connected to your spiritual journey. And some people may think that's utopian, but it's possible. And all of you are at university and you haven't made decisions in your life. This is the ideal time to do it. Because from my experience, most people out there are doing a job just because it gives them money. But they hate it, they're not inspired by it, and they definitely don't think they're making a change to the world by doing it. But because they're getting money, they just do it for 50 hours a week. But you have the opportunity to find a profession and engagement in which you can survive in this world and also make an incredible contribution to the world. And that's the idea, to marry both things. Yeah. Yeah. How do you reconcile times in your life when you're not living to your values or uh, in habitats that you shouldn't be in or uh, kind of maybe not following your purpose? Yeah. And then even if they still kind of can weigh down on your spirit or kind of pop up at times? Amazing. It's a great question. To continue with the analogies of planes, because it's what to do my life at the moment. When a plane goes from one airport to another, we just came from, um, where were we? Los Toronto. Angeles. Yeah, I just came from Los Angeles. LAX to SFO. Then there's a flight path. i tell you an interesting thing. On any given flight, the pilot is only ever on the flight path for about 20% of the journey. Most of the journey, the plane's like off because of wind, because of obstacles, because of whatever it may be. But the amazing thing is that after three hours or whatever it is, the plane still arrives at its destination. And why is that? Why do you think that is? It's always headed yeah. Or the pilot can correct for that. Yeah. That's the point. That the pilot's always trying to get back to the flight path. So what we try to do in life too much is look for perfection. But we'll never live the perfect year. We'll probably never live the perfect week. If you live the perfect day, you're doing well. Most of the time we will be off. We will fall short of our values. We will expose ourselves to things we know are not good. But if we have this self-awareness cemented within us and we keep trying to go back, then what will happen is more and more you'll kind of just end up on that flight path and the endeavor to keep going back to your values to go keep going back to your habitats eventually th those habitats and those values will become so ingrained within you that you live them so like sometimes uh, people ask us like how do you meditate uh, what's the art of focusing and what I tell people, the art of focusing is to keep refocusing. Because when you meditate, the idea is that we have this romantic idea that I'm going to sit down and then I'll just cross my legs and then I'll meditate and then I'll just be there. And it works for about three minutes. <laughs> and then our mind goes off. And then we think, oh no, I'm a failure, I can't meditate. No, no, but that's the point. Once your mind goes off, do you bring it back? Yes, I bring it back. Great. And then you know what? Your mind's going to go again. And then are you able to bring it back? 
And the more that you're able to do that in the process of meditation, keep bringing it back, eventually what you find after some time is you're able to just stay there. First we have to know these things and then what we can start doing in our life is consciously try to embrace these things. And then the next thing we'll do in our life is it will just become natural. In psychology, they say transformation goes through four stages. First stage is unconscious incompetence. You're doing something wrong and you don't even know. But the second stage of transformation is conscious incompetence. You're doing something wrong, but at least you know now. And the third stage of transformation is conscious competence. Now you're acting in the right way, but you have to really concentrate. And then eventually it becomes unconscious competence. You just do it without even thinking. So too often we're thinking like, why am I not unconsciously competent? <laughs> no, no, that's a journey. So let's just go on that journey, but it begins with orientation. And most people have not answered these questions, and therefore we're struggling. Have I noticed a pattern in what helped them to find their authentic self? Like yeah, that? Like yeah. I would say there's one trait which I've found in all people who have discovered their authenticity, which is the willingness and the bravery to challenge themselves. They say the most dangerous phrase in the English language is, we've always done it this way. <laughs> you know, like in the world, you have the concept of disruptors. Like, okay, we're just in ISV, so uh, Silicon Valley. Like, Apple, disruptive brand, comes into the industry and says, like, no, it doesn't have to be done like this. It can be done in a different way. Tesla, disruptive brand. Uber, Netflix. They come in and they're constantly challenging. But we also have to become disruptors to ourselves. We have to keep challenging ourselves, keep asking ourselves. When I became a monk, it was like, it was difficult for, you can imagine, for my parents. Like I had a degree, I had a job in the corporate world. And then it was so sweet. Once my mom, she came to me and she was like, can't you just be normal? <laughs> and I was like, Mom, it's too late, you know, I can't be normal. And then later on I read a quote by uh, one of the monks and he said, those who are now considered normal accept the values and principles of an insane world. And so the ability and the bravery and the, and the dedication to keep challenging everything that the world has told you that you should be that for me is like the foundation of finding your true authenticity and most people are just not ready to do that um, because it's uncomfortable and because you have to journey into the unknown and uh, most people are not ready to take that kind of disruption in their life which is okay in life, there's a tension between comfort and aspiration. And we have the choice of which one we want to embrace. Those who are convenience or comfort focused are experience starved. And therefore, what I found in all authentic people is they had that bravery and that diligence to keep asking themselves, is this what I should be doing? Is this who I am? Uh, and they never stop. That's also another point. That they never stop. It's not like, oh, I've reached it. No, no they're constantly, always. And, and it's beautiful. Some thoughts. Uh, any final question before we wrap up for today? Yes, okay. You, you get the final one. <laughs> um, yeah, this is one thing about when you're talking about Krishna's 
Arjuna, like Arjuna was a warrior, but he, he trained himself to be a warrior. We've heard stories about um, him, like there was no pressure from, from his teacher to like practice way more than what he was already doing, but he would just practice at night. He wanted to make sure that even if there was, he could like shoot arrows based on sound vibrations, he did the, he, he, was, he was very dedicated to his art. And, and Krishna, and then, and then this whole beautiful thing called Bhagavad Gita happened. Do we all also have some kind of like divine intervention where we are always like put on a path? Is there this, is, is destiny and fate, are they all true? Like we, we are made to mold ourselves and then finally when the calling happens, we are in the battlefield, is that for everybody? Okay, so you're asking about fate, free will, yes. uh, and uh, so you're welcome tonight at 6 p.m. at Stanford University. We're going to be talking about fate, free will, and destiny. <laughs> it is actually what we're speaking about tonight. So uh, how do I summarize that in a few moments? So what Krishna explains in the Bhagavad Gita is that each of us have free will. Without free will, life would be meaningless. If we're just pre-programmed robots and everything is predetermined, what would be the meaning of life? At the same time, Krishna says there are factors behind our control which are arch architects of our future. Clearly, you know, there are things beyond our control which are influencing us. And so what Krishna basically says is in the Bhagavad Gita is that life is an interplay of fate and free will. We have free will, however, we're not completely independent because there are factors which are limiting or, I would say limiting, but creating a stage for us on which we're acting. So, in Arjun's case, uh, it's, it, he had the free will, right? Like at the beginning of the war, he had the free will of how he wanted to respond. It's not that Krishna divinely arranged that, you know, I'm going to make Arjun at this point uh, find his purpose. Krishna didn't enforce himself upon Arjun. But Arjun at the beginning of the war had different options. He could have just walked away himself or he could have just carried on fighting even though he didn't resonate with it. But Arjun took the third option which was to go to the middle and ask questions. And because he asked questions, he then got the answers from Krishna which upgraded and gave him that divine purpose. So, uh, divinity responds to free will. This is a beautiful point. Even at the end of the Bhagavad Gita, after Krishna has said everything to Arjun, Krishna ends the conversation in a beautiful way. He says to Arjun, now I've given you all the knowledge, think about it analyze it, challenge it, reflect upon it and then do what you want to do. It's up to you. It's, which is a, a remarkable kind of coming from divinity. It's a remarkable, uh, like God is not a religious fanatic. Uh, there's no expectation. So divinity responds to our free will and as we use our free will to understand our purpose then divinity becomes active to try to guide us on that journey. And, and that's basically um, the trajectory that we learn from the Bhagavad Gita. So thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure to be with all of you. Um, we just kind of offered some points for you to think about. And uh, if you want to connect to any more of our courses or things, we have some things here. And we'll also hear about some of the future events coming up at, uh, here at Berkeley. Thank you very much for your time. Appreciate it.